Shalom and welcome to All the Colors of the Rainbow. In the last lesson, we discussed uh, one of the words for red, which is Adom, Aduma. And as I told you, there's another word, uh, which is actually usually translated scarlet, but we're going to look at that today. There are two words that are used together, uh, and they are Tola'at Sheni. And specifically, this scarlet uh, refers to an insect which the dried body of the female yields a dye to color the cloth scarlet or crimson. And we'll look into that a little bit further. Sometimes these words are used separately. They're always used together where it is talking about the scarlet for the tabernacle and also for the cleansing, the purification ritual for Tzara'at, which is uh, called leprosy. Exodus 25, 4, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair, talking about the tabernacle. Leviticus 14, 4, then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. This is a picture of the bug and uh, you can see that the way it grows, it uh, totally resembles the plant that it's sitting on. It almost looks like a fruit of the plant. We have a parallel word in English for a, a color, which is a red color, vermilion. And you can see right at the beginning, it's based on the idea of a worm. And it is a European dye, which is made from Kermes worms. Now these worms, uh, the skeletons of these bugs are still being used in food coloring in America. And uh, every so often somebody raises a protest, uh, vegetarians or kosher people. And so the companies tend to back off of using them. But you do need to be diligent if you're wanting to be a vegetarian or to just simply eat kosher because you don't want to be eating bugs. That there are two ingredients that you might find one is called carmine, the other one is, is called cochineal, and uh, you need to look for these ingredients, particularly in grapefruit juices or yogurt that has fruit or fruit flavored coffees and teas. Usually when the word tola is used by itself, it's just talking about any kind of worm or bug. Exodus 16.20 Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. Talking about the manna. So the root, tola, comes from the root yala, which means to, um, to eat up something. So the idea is the worm consuming the manna, or here in Jonah 4.7, but God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. So the, that worm ate up the vine which was providing Jonah his shade. In Psalm 22, 6, in this uh, prophecy of the death of Yeshua, it is written, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. We'll see in a little bit what a deep meaning that has. Isaiah 41, 14. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith Yahweh, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So when a, a person is in a very lowly estate, we might think of him as being a worm. The second word, shani, when it's used by itself, is almost always translated as scarlet. And it has to do with some stuffs that are dyed that color from that worm. Genesis 38, 28. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. In the story of Tamar and the twins, uh, Zerach broke out first, and uh, he he had that red string tied around his wrist, and then his brother Peretz broke out ahead of him. And 
even though Zerach is marked as the older of the twins, Peretz is the one who's going to carry the line of Messiah. In Joshua 2.18, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. So this is marking the window where Rahab's family is living so that they don't uh, spoil her household during the Battle of Jericho. Now this root, Shani, also has another meaning, uh, which means a second or other or again or some kind of doubling. We see in Genesis 1.8, And God called the firmament in heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So outside of the vowels, these two words look exactly the same, and we will see what their relationship is. Genesis 4.19, And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of one was Adah, and the name of the other, the second one, was Zilah. 2 Samuel 16.19, and again, a second time, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son, as I have served in his father's presence? So will I be in thy presence? We're going to talk about the parent root for Shani. A parent root is a two-letter phoneme which expresses uh, an idea, but might not be a word by itself. In this case, it is a word by itself. Shen nun shen means tooth, and by extension, ivory. Exodus 21-24, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. 1 Kings 10-18, moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. This is also the name of the letter Shin. In an extended form, shin nun he, shana, it means to change or repeat. Genesis 41:32, And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. In 1 Samuel 21:13, And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hands, and scrabbled on the doors of the gate, and let his spittle fell down upon his beard. So what ties all these ideas together is the idea of change. And particularly when we see the action of the bug, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, there is a change that takes place. You might recognize this root with the he on it, shana. A shana is a year. It's a repeat of the same cycle that went before. I know that when some people teach the letter shin, they teach that it means destruction because of the teeth and because the idea of chewing. But think about it, it's really something that happens again, and even in your teeth, you get two sets of teeth. So uh, there's another presentation on this uh, YouTube channel about the number two. You can find out more about this there. Again, in Psalm 34, 1, a Psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. 1 Kings 14, 2. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself. In other words, change yourself so you're not recognizable, that thou wilt be not known to the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people. So the idea behind the red color, behind the teeth, behind the year, is change. Now we're going to look at the uh, ashes of the red heifer, and we see both the reds are going to appear together in this ritual. In Numbers 19.2, this is the ordinance of the law which Yahweh have commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer, that's para aduma, that's the adom, without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. And into the fire with that animal in Numbers 19.6. And the priest shall take cedar wood 
and hyssop and scarlet. And here it talks about the other, the tola'at sheni, and cast it into the midst of the burning heifer. So the only other place where we see these three things, the cedar with the hyssop and the scarlet, are in the purification for the tzara'at, for the leprosy. That's a whole different study. It's quite interesting. But here we see both of the things being burned together to generate the ashes of the red heifer. And here is a nice red heifer. And uh, I do believe that this is actually Chaim Richman, who was one of the directors of the Temple Institute, probably in his younger days, checking out a red heifer. As I said earlier in the previous lesson on red, every so often we hear a little report, oh, they found the red heifer, but uh, so far nothing has uh, panned out that we know of. Uh, here's a website. You can read more about the red heifer from the Temple Institute. The ritual of the ashes of the red heifer is uh, somewhat cryptic. The uh, Jewish people consider it to be what they call a chok. It's a law that we obey even though we don't understand what it means. But they do say that it will be understood in messianic times. The animal itself is slain outside the city on the Mount of Olives. And even though it is used for the purification of those who are in a high degree of impurity, the actual ritual causes impurity to the priests who prepare it. So that's kind of a little uh, oxymoron. They say that the first uh, heifer was burned in Moses' time and the second was burned in Ezra's time, and seven others have been burnt since then. The ashes are always mixed with the ashes of the previous uh, heifer that they have uh, kept a continual line of uh, some original uh, medium from the day one when Moses burnt the first heifer. Of course, these now are missing, and so there's a big question about whether can, if we even find the heifer, uh, can we prepare it because we don't have the original, to which Chaim Richmond says, it doesn't matter, we can prepare it. Uh, it is said that Messiah himself will supervise the burning of the 10th heifer, or they believe that Yahweh himself will purify the people. Interesting concept. They also say that the fate of the whole world hangs on the ashes of the red heifer because it's something that stands against despair. I think basically we understand that we are living uh, sort of in messianic times because we do have some light of Messiah in our life. And we can see how much of this ritual lines up with the things that Yeshua accomplished on our behalf. Here's another place where the words all appear together in Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, saith Yahweh. Though your sins be as scarlet, the sheni, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red, here's the adom, like crimson, tola, like that worm, they shall be as wool, as white as wool. This is a quote from Henry Morris, who is a well-versed creation teacher. And this really paints out the picture of that worm, that tola acheni, the picture that's given with the truth of Messiah's sacrifice. When the female of the scarlet worm species was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she would never leave again. The eggs deposited beneath her body were thus protected until the larvae were hatched and able to enter their own life cycle. As the mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body and the surrounding wood. From the dead bodies of such female scarlet worms, the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted. What a picture this gives us of Messiah, dying on the tree, shedding his precious blood, that he might bring many sons to glory. He died for us, that we might live through him. Psalm 22, 6, as we have already read, describes such a worm and gives us this picture of Messiah.
Next time, we will move on to another color of the rainbow. In the meantime, Tasimata Inayim al Hashemayim. Keep your eyes on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom. Oh